Welcome, this is Scott Gilchrist with the Romans Project of Nigeria. I'm excited today as we're uh, studying the book of Acts together. The book of Acts is a crucial book in the New Testament. It picks up uh, the life of Jesus after the resurrection and tells us what he did in and through his believers by his Holy Spirit. I'm excited as we study this book together. Oh Lord, you are the mighty God. You're strong and mighty, almighty. No wonder we sing out because you are for us. You sent your son, your only begotten son, into this world of sin and chaos and rebellion. This is great love indeed, and we thank you that we can worship you this morning and sing out and gladly say you are awesome. We thank you and invite you now to teach us. You are the teacher. Your Holy Spirit delights in glorifying your Son. So we ask that you would uh, take distraction from us. Uh, just help us in these next few minutes to just listen to really listen to your voice, to listen to you, and to heed and to obey what we hear, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. As the Father has sent me, Jesus said, so I send you. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. He who does not honor me does not honor the Father who sent me. In fact, you can hear that word sent 35 times in the Gospel of John alone, referring to Jesus. He was very cognizant that he had been sent. And he said, as he prayed to the Father, he said, As you have sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. John 17. Verse 18, the Father did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Been sent. Acts is a missionary book. I mean, you can't miss it. As we've been looking at it, it's very much from the first page on a sending book. The gospel is sent. We are on mission. And we've come to chapter 13 and I'll tell you, it's a major, I, want to, I don't want to say division, I'm going to say a, a major expansion point. Uh, up to now, you know, the gospel has pretty much resounded forth from Jerusalem. And Peter has been the centerpiece uh, of the human side of things. He proclaimed the gospel to Israel in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. They waited till the Holy Spirit got there, and then he proclaimed the gospel to Jews. And God said, Jesus had said to him earlier, you know, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. And he used the, that he was commissioned, and he opened the gospel up to Jews. And then they brought him down when Philip went down to Samaria. They brought Peter down. And the gospel went to Samaritans. And then in chapter 10 and 11, two whole chapters, where he devotes the, the breakthrough it was when Peter took the gospel, and he wasn't even eager to do it. You remember the story. He had to be, he had to see a vision three times. But he obediently took the gospel to the Gentiles. So he opened up the door, you might say, to the Jews, the Samaritans, the Gentiles. But everything has still been right there in what we call Palestine, Israel. The land right there, you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. 
Uh, Cornelius was a Gentile, but he was right down there at the coast. Uh, and Jerusalem is still the, the centerpiece. Now in chapter 13, Paul's going to take precedence. And you have the three, from here to the end of the book, really, you have the three great missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. And uh, rather than Jerusalem being kind of the focal point, uh, actually Antioch up in Syria becomes the sending church uh, and the place where he reports back to, you might say. And uh, I think it's important to see that. And, and we've been away from this a bit. Then we had the week of prayer, so we, we really emphasized in chapter 12 what the 12th chapter emphasizes, prayer, what was going on back at Jerusalem, why James was killed and Peter was going to be. The church prayed, God delivered but we might lose a little bit of our context here, so I want to remind you of the structure of this book as the Holy Spirit, through Luke, helps us see. I was talking with someone this week who's really caught the picture for giving themselves to Romans and is just really enjoying Romans, reading Romans repeatedly. And they asked, what would be a good background for this? Because they can sense there's something going on, you know. There's a setting for the book of Romans, and uh, I said, Acts, Acts, because Acts tells what's going on as the epistles were written. And so, again, let me just kind of visualize it or look at the text if you want. Jesus kind of outlined the book in one sense when he said, you're going to be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power, and the power of the Holy Spirit is primarily given to us to witness. Now, don't, don't let me depreciate in any way the fact that really the Holy Spirit is the energy for every aspect of the Christian life. You know, the Christian life is impossible to live in your own strength. So I remind you regularly, I remind myself regularly that apart from him, we can do nothing. He's the vine, we're the branches, we got to abide in him. We must consciously remember that he, through his Holy Spirit, lives through us. But just the same, when he speaks of power, he's not saying, he, he's not really emphasizing the power in various aspects of the Christian life. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's not true. I'd just say that when the Bible articulates it, you're going to receive power to be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, and there you have, and I'm quoting, of course, the 8th verse, which I think is the key to this book, the 8th verse of chapter 1. In Jerusalem, the first seven chapters, they stayed right in Jerusalem. In Judea and Samaria, expanding out into the next region, you have chapters 8 through 12. That's where we've been, really. And then the remotest parts of the earth, chapter 13 and onward. God, through the Apostle Paul, is going to take the gospel all around the Roman Empire. And so this is a great expansion. Uh, but God has prepared the way. Uh, this is a key point, but God has prepared the way. Remember in chapters 6, 7, and 8, he raised up two deacons who were basically evangelists. Even though they were waiting tables, they, they were greatly used in evangelism. So Stephen and Philip, Stephen proclaimed the gospel to Israel, chapter 7. Philip to the Ethiopians and the Samaritans. And then we saw two key conversions, chapter 9, the Jewish Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, Saul of Tarsus, transformed by meeting Christ. And then chapters 10 and 11, a Gentile, Cornelius. And it happens in chapter 10 and chapter 11, Peter has to defend what happened as he takes it back, the news back to the church. So I pointed out at the time, and I'll just remind you, that you already have, God's gospel is for the world, okay? It's not for just Americans or just Israel 
or any little pocket. No, it's not a Western thing. The gospel is universal. God so loved the world. And in these chapters, even before I get here to 13, we've seen him open up the gospel to the three great branches, you might say. Because, yeah, we all go back to Adam, but remember God had to start over with Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And you have the Ethiopian of the branch of Ham saved in chapter 8. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, the Jew's Jew, Shem, and Japheth, the Gentile, uh, Cornelius. So you have the three branches of the human race. And I think it's intentional that God kind of not only told us this, but it paved the way for when we come now to chapter 13, sending missionaries. And now it is a geographic expansion. In other words, to get the gospel out, there must be geographic movement. Yeah, you can reach an Ethiopian and a Gentile and a Samaritan and a Jew there in Palestine, but the church now intentionally sends overseas missionaries. This is prompted, this expansion here in 13, if you notice, we'll see. It was prompted not by persecution. That was what prompted earlier expansion, you know. As they got spread out from Jerusalem, they took the gospel with them, and they were proclaiming the word. And God used persecution to kind of prompt the church, perhaps, to get busy. But now you have the church intentionally sending missionaries. And uh, let me just say... It happens at Antioch. Antioch is a healthy church. Um, a healthy church will be a sending church. I was talking to a, a missionary executive recently, an executive in the sense that work has, was a missionary for many years and now works in mobilizing other mission missionaries within his mission and equipping churches, and he said, you know, most of the churches today in America, most of the church plants, the new churches are not very missionary-minded. And I was sad to hear it, but it wasn't like it was news to me because I've noticed that. In my lifetime, I've watched churches become much more here and now centered and us-centered rather than sending, you know. And I just say a healthy church is ascending. And by the way, the church is what? people Christians a healthy Christian is not just looking for what I can get and what I need but is thinking as Jesus came and said as I've been sent so I send you and a healthy Christian is praying about and partnering with and giving and supporting outreach here and around the world so, with that as kind of an introduction, uh, we want to look at chapter 13. Now there were at Antioch, in the church that was there. That's where it starts. And I'll just say, um, Antioch is a healthy church. Let's not forget what we've already seen. So let's turn back, because chapter 12 was, in one sense, parenthetical. Uh, let's go back to chapter 11, because it's been a while for us. Let's just walk back. And enjoy it. Verse 19. So then those who were scattered, chapter 11, verse 19, because of the persecution that arose in connection with Stephen. Like I said, the expansion earlier was from persecution. Those who were scattered because of that persecution made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. This is the birth of the church at Antioch. These men from Cyprus, the island there in the northeast part of the Mediterranean that we'll see in a minute uh, where they start, actually, and Cyrene, that North African city 
that it'd be in modern Libya, right kind of south across the Mediterranean Sea from Greece. So the gospel had spread out. Well, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, and of course, people came to Israel, came to Jerusalem, and on the day of Pentecost even, people from all over the empire were saved. So these men took the gospel to Antioch. And in Antioch, they began to take the gospel not to just Jews, but also to Greeks preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, they, they were being obedient. That's what Jesus said to do. But it's noteworthy that we're told that's what happened. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number believed. And the news about them, verse 22, reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Remember that? The church at Jerusalem said, wow, what's happening up there? Send Barnabas up there. Well, he, when he'd come, witnessed the grace of God. He rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and, and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord, he repeats. When, it, when Barnabas got there, not only did he see a lot of people were coming to Christ, but he encouraged them. And that's who he was. He's an encourager. He's the son of encouragement. He, his nickname is Barnabas, really, son of encouragement. His name was Joseph, but the apostles nicknamed him Barnabas. And more came to Christ so that he left, verse 25, for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he'd found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came about that for an entire year... They met together with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They had a year-long Bible conference, you might say, or you know, teaching, regular basis, Barnabas and Saul opening up God's word. I met a guy this week who... Uh, we, I just getting to know him, and and we we sat down after uh, actually after downtown, and he he told me how he came to Christ. And anyway, he mentioned that he'd gone to Multnomah's grad course, and I thought, oh man, that's that one year intense time to just study the Bible, and I never went to it. But I sent guys to it back in those days when it was thriving, and I'll tell you what, you can so much can happen in a year. When you just learn the scripture. And that's what they did. They taught, notice, for an entire year. Saul and Barnabas. And uh, the disciples were first called Christians. They were so Christ-like that they were labeled Christians. And uh, I still think we should be happy to be called Christians. Uh, it's maybe used as a form of derision. It might have been in Antioch little Christians <laughs> we don't know but I'll tell you what they were followers of Christ and uh, they were first called Christians there at Antioch now as we look at what takes place they there were in Antioch well I should I shouldn't skip really uh, now at this time some prophets verse 27 came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and one of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion, when they heard there was going to be this famine, in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution to the relief of the brethren in Judea. So they sent the money in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So Barnabas and Saul went down to Jerusalem with the money. We saw this parenthetical scene almost uh, parenthetical in the book here because he's talking about what's going on at Antioch but we saw the deliverance of Peter through prayer the death of Herod and let me pick it up now at verse 24 of chapter 12 the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they'd fulfilled their mission. They brought the relief money to Jerusalem, and they returned to Antioch, taking along with them Barnabas' cousin, uh, John, who was also called 
Mark. Now, there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they'd reached Salamis, that's the city there in Cyprus, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. Now I want to just walk through that and just notice so many things because it seems to me Luke is very cognizant that this is a major turning point. The church intentionally sends men out to take the word of God overseas to other places around the whole known world. And uh, let's just start at verse 24 because that's really where they probably should have put the chapter break. I mean, you know, uh, he's getting back now to what, what happened. After Jerusalem scene, you know, he says, the word of the Lord continued to grow. By the way, the word of the Lord, the word of God, spreading, proclaimed, growing. Just watch for that as you read Acts. God's word going out, spreading. That's church expansion. That's what God That's how the good news came to me, came to you. The word of God. Well, the word of God continued to grow and they sent Barnabas and and Saul uh, from Jerusalem back to Antioch, and the uh, church at Antioch is described for us. There was at the church at Antioch, notice the diversity. Do you see it? I mean, they were blessed with a lot of gifted men, and they had uh, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who'd been brought up with the Herod. And Saul. So you have Barnabas and Saul, the two familiar names, and then three less familiar names. But you look at it, and this church was really being blessed. As God's word was taught, and as they were thriving, there they were they had a, a multitude of gifted men, prophets, and teachers were told. He doesn't define that uh, in the New Testament. When he says prophets, he's not speaking of the Old Testament prophets. He's speaking of New Testament prophets. And they were men who God used to speak forth God's word during this New Testament era. And uh, there's a couple little passages over. Turn over to Ephesians for just a second. Ephesians 4. He, the risen Christ, gave some as apostles and some as prophets, and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Uh, I take it that in the New Testament era, he gave some as apostles and prophets. These were revelatory gifts. They spoke forth the truth. They wrote books of the Bible. The apostles did. And uh, you'll notice every time they're mentioned, look back at chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 20. They're mentioned in such a way that we don't confuse them with the Old Testament prophets. He's not talking about Isaiah and those guys. He's talking about New Testament prophets. He says uh, when he's talking about the church being a great building that God is building, God's household, chapter 2, verse 19 having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. God used apostles and prophets to lay the foundation, the cornerstone who's Christ. They proclaimed Christ. They wrote the book of Romans. They wrote all the epistles. And these prophets would speak forth God's word, sometimes in very specific ways. We just saw Agabus, for instance, who said there's going to be a famine to the church at Antioch. And uh, more often, I would think, they were used to speak forth in a prophetic way the word of God. Uh, Look over at chapter 15 of Acts for just a moment. Chapter 15, verse uh, 32, we're told that Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. So they were men who spoke forth God's word. I take it that today... If I look at Ephesians 4, he said he gave some as apostles and prophets and some as evangelists and teachers. Today he gives preachers and teachers. And those revelatory gifts have ceased because God's revelation is complete. But the same parallel, the same role of evangelists proclaiming God's word and teachers explaining God's word are still very... uh, much a part of what a healthy church needs and we've seen it already in acts uh, stephen and philip philip was actually called the evangelist and uh, we bring the good news and proclaim it well these men he doesn't tell which were which he just says there was prophets and teachers and notice barnabas he was a levite from cyprus we know that from chapter four just notice the diversity of this group barnabas simeon who was called Niger, he was, uh, which means black, by the way, it's the Latin term, the Roman term for black. He was dark complexioned. And I remember when I was in Ghana and I was teaching 1,200 pastors and uh, the fellow that was teaching with me, Billy Antwanti, he was such a gifted African man and he was, was I would call him an evangelist and a pastor teacher I mean he just he and we ought not to make a big distinction between those two things really proclamation of the gospel and explaining the gospel and explaining God's word but he he was gifted on both sides I'll tell you that and I remember he he opened this passage up in one session and I thrilled as he shared the diversity of this group and I remember when he said look at that second one Simon who was also called Niger, black. He was a black African, and there was a roar through the audience, you know. Yeah. They were part of it from the beginning, you know. And it was exciting to think about. There are some, by the way, uh, who think he might have been. From, we know that the church was founded by men from Cyrene, that he might have been a black African from North Africa, Cyrene, because the next guy we know, Lucius, was of Cyrene. And there are some who think that this might be the Simon, spelled just a hair different, uh, that ended up carrying the cross of Jesus and uh, was the father of Rufus and Alexander that Paul got to know really well, so much so that he said, greet Rufus and his mother and mine in Romans 16, like he was part of their family almost. Well, that would follow if he had been spending time on a teaching team in Antioch with this man we really don't know that but it's kind of an interesting speculation and then there was Lucius of Cyrene the North African and uh, and then notice this one Manian who had been brought up with Herod the term that's used could be translated like was a foster brother he'd been raised in the home of Herod Wow, what an amazing diversity that God, through the gospel, brought together to where there's a guy that was brought up with Herod. Who, which Herod? The Herod that slaughtered John the Baptist. The Herod that mocked our Lord Jesus. This guy was brought up in that home. He knew Herod well. They grew up together. He'd met Christ, and he's a transformed man. And he might be 
one who gave some of the details to Luke as Luke did his investigations to write this history of some of the house, what went on in the house of Herod and some of the detail that we get in the gospel of Luke about uh, Herod. But it's an amazing thing. And then, of course, we have Saul, the last one on the list, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Well, while they were ministering, verse 2, while they were ministering, to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Don't miss anything there. While they were ministering, God works in lives that are given to him. They were already ministering. He steers moving ships I often mention that when men ask me, they're trying to discern God's will, particularly young men. But I don't care what age you are. Get moving. Serve. Be at work. Do what we know we should be doing. And God steers moving ships, and they were ministering to the Lord. They were already teaching and preaching and evangelizing, and that's when God said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work which I've called them and by the way I'll mention it just in passing look at verse 2 they were ministering to the vast crowds no they were ministering to the people no it doesn't say that what does it say ministering to the Lord all ministry I mean they were ministering to crowds maybe vast crowds I don't know but they were ministering to people and when I'm teaching this morning I'm teaching you and I'm speaking to you but oh to remember that ultimately ministering and he uses a term here for ministry that the Bible regularly uses is offering a sacrifice of worship to the Lord They were ministering to the Lord. And that's a great perspective to remember in all your ministry. You're teaching some kids in a Sunday school class. You're teaching those kids. You're investing in them, but you're doing it. Your audience really is to the Lord. And uh, that's good to remember. And they were fasting. It looks as if there was maybe a, a special time or day set apart to worship pray and fast and the Holy Spirit spoke and said set apart for me he he initiates this set apart for me the work to which I've called these men you say well how did he say that well I would take it that he spoke to one or more of the prophets in the group and they spoke for the Lord then and the Lord said set apart for me Saul I want to say Saul and Barnabas, but notice it's Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas is the leading man in this whole section of Acts. Uh, as a po- He's the one that took Saul under his arm and you know, mentored him. We'll see that change uh, later on, but for now, it's Barnabas and Saul. And I want you to notice that uh, he had called them. I don't fully understand what... A calling is but I will say this this wasn't just a volunteerism hey who wants to go (laughs) no the Holy Spirit called them I remember when I actually was called to uh, come here Uh, my Irish step granddad my granddad had died when I was a baby and my Irish step-granddad, whom I knew as my grandpa really my whole life, uh, he said, ah, oh, the call. And I kind of went, the call? <laughs> I didn't know for sure what he meant, but I did know what he meant. Ah, oh, the call, he said. And he had a reverence for that, that God puts his hand and guides us in these things. And it's not just a matter of methods or logic. Uh, God sets us apart for certain things. And he said, I've set these men apart for the work 
to which I have called them. It was specific enough to be followed. It was general enough. He doesn't say, I've set them apart to go to Cyprus, and then I want them going up into Asia. I don't know if he said that or not later. But he didn't say that now. He said, to the work to which I've called them. And often that seems to me the way it is in our lives. Abram, the Lord said to Abram, Genesis 12, kind of the first call you might say. Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's household, to the land to which I've called you. And he doesn't say where. He just says, go forth, leave from, to. Follow me. And uh, that's what happened here. So the church obeyed, verse 3. Then when they'd fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. I want you to notice both uh, the prayer aspect of this and the identification. The church prayed and fasted and laid their hands on them. This wasn't an ordination. These men were veterans. Uh, This was an identifying with this mission and these missionaries. And when we bring missionaries up here from time to time, we as elders will represent the congregation and lay hands on them, and we really can't confer any special blessing. We don't want to be misunderstood in that way. But in the Scripture, laying on of hands was an identification an association and a partnership. And the church at Antioch took this seriously. We're part of what's going to happen through these men. And they laid hands on them and identified with them and sent them away. So, verse 4, being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that. There's a partnership Verse 3, they were sent out by who? The church. Verse 4, by who? The Holy Spirit. I think one of the roles of church leaders is to pray over and be sensitive to whom God is raising up for every role and partner with the Holy Spirit. And it's thrilling to me. I um, was trying to think who I was writing recently. Just a quick note, and they asked what's going on, and and I just mentioned you know, some of what's happened in the last 12, 14, I mean, 12 to 24 months and the sending of missionary missionaries that we've done as a church. And, and we should not just, they, they're more than a picture on the fridge, you know. They're, they're, we're partnering with them. And we are sending them, but the Holy Spirit's sending them. He's putting it on their heart to go. And if you pressed me, what is a call? I would say he puts it on your heart to where... You don't want to do anything else. You want to do, you want to go. And we've seen our missionaries, they don't like the, necessarily the lifestyle. They don't like necessarily the travel. They don't like necessarily the living conditions and the lack of medical help and the way that their kids are going to be, like I was thinking of David and Julie in, in China and their, the kids' fingernails turning black because of the pollution. I don't think they'd choose that. That's not what they want but they feel constrained to be on mission. And a call is that way. The Holy Spirit says, set set apart for me to the work to which I've called these guys. And then the church prays and identifies with it. And so you have in verse 3, the church sending, and in verse 4, the Holy Spirit sending. Missions is not a healthy mission. Is not just a product of methodology and technique. and No, it's cooperating with the Holy Spirit. And where there's health and where there's local ministry going on, then there will be those who are raised up to take the gospel out. And so, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, that's the port city for Antioch, about 16 miles down the Orontes River, And they got to Seleucia, and from there, they sailed about 60 miles to Cyprus, the third largest island, you know, in the Mediterranean. You've got uh, Sicily and Crete and Cyprus, and that's right over in the northeast corner. And they went to Cyprus, and uh, we know that 
Barnabas was born there. He was a Levite of Cyprian birth. He'd been born there. So he knew the, the island. There were a couple leading cities. And when they reached one of those leading cities, Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they also had, by the way, you know, Luke notes, John, uh, John as their helper. Um, don't miss that. They began to proclaim the word of God. They began to announce. That's what the word means. Announce the word of God. The mission of the church. The mission of missions. <laughs> the mission of missionaries. The mission, you know, we're, we live in a world where we say, what's our mission statement? Well, don't ever forget that we are to proclaim the word of God. We're to announce it. So we don't go just merely, and listen to me carefully, I don't want to say this in a way that would distract, but we don't merely go to love or to love the city, as we're told today. No, we go, and yes, they marveled in the New Testament at how they loved one another. And this is how they'll know you're my disciples, by your love for one another. And we do proclaim the love of God. We sang about it this morning and tonight. And, and right now, I mean, I tell you, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We proclaim his love, but we proclaim it in context with the gospel. We don't merely model it or show it or share it. I, don't, I say merely. Oh, we should model that love, and it should be characteristic of our of us, but that's not our mission, and I think it's important to say that. Our mission is to proclaim, and we do it in love. We speak the truth in love. We proclaim a God of love who demonstrated his love by giving his son on a cross, and wherever the gospel goes, the Holy Spirit uses that truth to penetrate hearts, and blinded eyes are opened, and so you have, we've already seen so much expansion here in the book of Acts, and that's what we're going to see in these great missionary journeys, but you will notice that wherever they went, they proclaimed, they announced, and we need to remember that. We have a message to proclaim. And they did it, notice, in the synagogues of the Jews. Synagogues, plural. There was quite a Jewish uh, population to have more than one synagogue in that city. So there's quite a Jewish population. But this became Paul's pattern. Even though Paul was very much called to take the gospel to the Gentiles, he'd always start in the synagogue, it seems. It was just his pattern. And I was studying Romans with a group of business leaders this week and just the first section, you know. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. They were chewing on that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And you see that patterned here. The mission of the church at Antioch, the mission of the church at Southwest, teach, preach, proclaim, the word of God. This is the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. The angel tells John way out in Revelation 19, if you're called to evangelize, and we are, or teach, and we are. If you have the gift of evangelism, if you're an evangelist or if you're a teacher, talk about Jesus. You want to see fruit? Proclaim Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And they went out proclaiming the Lord Jesus. Let me say in a group like this, today, if you're hearing and you've come here but you're not really, you're not, you don't know for sure if you're related to Christ, we're glad you're here. And if you've heard what I'm saying, let me tell you, God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son to die in your place. And he didn't just die, he rose again. And he offers to all who will believe as a free gift, eternal life. You believe in the Lord Jesus. You put your trust in him. You come to him as a sinner. 
and he will save you gloriously. He'll change you from the inside out. And you'll be a new creature in Christ. That's how every one of us in this room who know Christ, that's how we got here. That's how we got into his family. We were born again into his family through faith in Jesus. And then I say to us who know him, let's be sure that we're partnering with the Holy Spirit. A healthy church is a sending church. A healthy Christian is not just looking for what I can get out of this sermon or what I can get out of this Bible study, but always we're being equipped to reach out with the gospel. And if we're not empowered, let me put, turn that around, we are empowered, and if we're not witnessing, we're quenching the Holy Spirit. I think we're grieving him. No, but when we open our mouth, when we take opportunity, at the men's breakfast the other day, Gary just said, it might be as simple as just telling the guys at the office that your first appointment this morning was at 9.30. Or, not 9.30, what time was that we met? 5.30. <laughs> your first, my first meeting today was 5.30. What were you doing at 5.30? And the door is open to tell them what you're doing met with some Christian guys, we were praying. Look for opportunities to unleash the Holy Spirit through us. Thanks for joining us today in our time in the book of Acts. This program is brought to you by the Romans Project of Nigeria in conjunction with Southwest Bible Church in the United States of America.